trickling out into the corners. You know, there were a lot of students in attendance for this event, and the minute the game started, from the opening tip, before the opening tip, yeah. you know, this, the crowd was into it, the crowd was excited, the crowd was feeding off of our energy early in the game, Absolutely. and, and then we lost it. You know, but that has been this team's MO all season long. You know, we've talked about it over and over again. You put in uh, you know, a good 20 minutes, you put in a good 25 minutes, you know, 10 minutes, as it was the case today. You put in a very good stretch, but you can't put together 40 minutes. You can't put together, you know, dating back to Thursday, you know, we put together a solid maybe 50 minutes of basketball. But you can't get to that 80, 120 mark that we're going to have to get to eventually in order to win the CAA tournament. And this is the time where it needs to start to show up. We said it in the pregame show that some of our best play had been coming towards the second half of the season. Right. And tonight we just didn't show it. I mean, you can think back to the point in time where they just went on, what is it, I mean, a 17-something run. Right. And they just started dominating. Um, Coach Hewitt mentioned that again in the press conference. There were those three fouls that happened that we saw. Uh, we saw him go up to the ref and say, you know, that's three calls in a row right. that went exactly your way that were arguable in any case. Um, and, and we just lost it. I don't understand how just one scenario like, like that takes away all the air. Right. Takes away everything from the entire arena. And you can definitely tell that our players feed off the fans. Right. I mean, we've been able to see that through the past three seasons, how um, successful we've been in the Patriot Center. And this season, after dropping three straight, we just haven't shown that. We were 9-0 and in the Patriot Center last season in conference. This year, overall, 6-5. and yeah. So that, that's what our stats look like. In today's game, you know, you mentioned those, that stretch of three calls in a row uh, that were questionable. Right. <laughs> if I'm being political, questionable. Um, but the next time, you know, you, you get so wrapped up in watching Coach Hewitt and watching, you know, the referees and watching the players' reactions and all that, the next time you look up at the, at the scoreboard, we're down 18. Right, all of a sudden. And, and at that point, I think you said it best, you can't just go on a 7-2 run right. and then give it up. They go on a 5-0 run, we go on a 9-2 run. I mean, there was one point in the game, we went on an 11-2 run, we were still down 18-17 right. point. I mean, it just, um, it, it just fell apart, right. is, it, the, is the simplest way to say it. Right. Well, basketball, <laughs> you know, I've said it over and over, basketball is a game of runs. But basketball is not a game of 20-2 runs. Right. You know, or 25 to, to whatever, a lot to a little run. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and 20 plus, it was a lot. It was a lot. I mean, and speaking of some of those runs, I mean, their their defense mobbed us at certain points. Yeah. Zone and man, they were double teaming us on the perimeter. Their rotation was great. Eight steals, 13 turnovers. They forced two blocks. Um, it says it all right there. Their defense was great. It, it, it doesn't take away from how bad we played, but right. you got to give them some credit. Right. Well, Ron Hunter, uh, the coach for Georgia State, mentioned in his press conference that he didn't want to coach against Paul Hewitt. You know, Paul Hewitt is a, a, an outstanding coach. He right. didn't want to have to do that. He wanted to coach against Corey Edwards and Brian Allen. He wanted to throw eight different defenses at him, and he did. Yeah. He w and he was very successful in doing so. Yeah, they looked great on defense. I mean, it, it says it all right here. Eight steals, 13 turnovers. We've been doing great with our ball control. Right. Ever since we put Corey and Brian, I feel like, into that starting lineup, our turnover numbers have gone way down. Um, this says it all right here, and I think something interesting was posed in the post-game press conference uh, and asked Coach Hewitt, can we get better? And, and I think we were both kind of puzzled by that question. Do you think we can get better? Yeah, it, it's an definitely an interesting question depending on which way you look at this you know can we get better from a you know a, a playing standpoint I, I don't know right you know because when you look at the first 10 minutes of our ball game tonight when you look at the first you know 20 minutes of that directional game a couple weeks ago I'm not sure we can get better that was an outstanding stretch where we can get better though is 
putting together 40 minute stretches like that. Right. You know what I mean? It, it's we we have way too many games where we sit and, and listen to you know Coach Hewitt or Sherrod or who, or any of these other players who sit and talk about you know what we played very well for 10 minutes. Right. You know our energy was great in the early going, but we didn't do so hot after that. You know why? Yeah, I, I don't understand why, and I don't think. I mean, better is such a relative term, but our right. skill's not going to be better. I think this is the starting five you're going to see through the tournament. I think Coach Hewitt likes it. We certainly like the starting yeah. five. Um, the skill is there. The fundamentals are there. The plays are there. The execution has to be better. It has to be better. I mean, if you're not winning your home games, how are you going to win three, three in three days in Richmond? Right. You've got to start to put the packages together now and then take them, take them down to Richmond. Luckily, we won't see Georgia State again. We may never see them again. <laughs> right. Um, but so... Take away from this what you can, from a personal Mason standpoint, you're not going to have to face uh, Georgia State again in the tournament. Right. So that's another thing to look at. A couple of miscellaneous stats from Georgia State. Uh, only five players on their team scored, believe it or not. Four players with over 34 minutes, and they had 21 second chance points. So it kind of shows you how we were on the boards, uh, things like that. Uh, overall, I mean, what more can you say than just a disappointing loss? Right. We still have more show coming up for you here. We will be right back with our keys to success live from the Mason Inn. Stick around. Welcome back to the Courtside Seats post game show. I'm Cody Norman with Daniel Zimmett. Dan's giving us our keys to success. I don't know how you can call it success tonight, <laughs> unfortunately. I'm just going to call it the keys tonight. Yes. Uh, first one, limit turnovers. We had 13, as mentioned earlier. Georgia State only had seven. Uh, we had 13 turnovers to the 13 assists. That puts us at a zero ratio, way off of where we've been, especially since Brian Allen's been stepping up his game. Uh, I think their defense really surprised our ball handlers at times. Their rotations, their switch from zone to man in the middle of the shot clock um, really caught us off guard at times and we just couldn't handle it. A D on the grade uh, for limit turnovers. Second one, take and make the three. We were eight for 21 for 38 percent way below where we've been we've been right around the 40 range uh, most of the season we almost shot more threes than made field goals i think we shot 21 i think we made 23 so that kind of shows you uh the three point game that we were putting up today especially after Sherrod started four for four and Bertrail hit one in that span of time so we're about five for seven five for eight and then we ended eight for 21. i don't know how that happens that's why i'm going d minus on take and make the three finally cody win the rebound battle uh, once again, no surprise, lost the rebound battle. 27 to 34 overall, 9 and 11 on the offensive, lost in both categories. Uh, we've been dominating the boards, especially with the loss of Johnny Williams. We shut down Jamel Higgins um, from Delaware. We didn't do a great job on the boards tonight. D uh, on that category, plus the 18 point loss, add it all together. We gotta go with an F today, unfortunately. That's why I can't call it the keys to success. I'm just calling it the keys. So, unfortunately, the F. Well, <laughs> you know if you're getting an F from the easy professor. From, from the, the giant curve guy, it hurt so much, it still couldn't take it away. <laughs> the giant curve guy gives you an F. Yeah. Let's start, my number one, we gotta spread the ball, spread the score. We had two players today uh, who were in double figures. Sherrod Wright with 19, and Marco Vianicic with 10. We broke even in the assist to turnover ratio, as Dan, as Dan mentioned. Not a very good job spreading the ball. Just, we looked out of sorts. You know, their defense really baffled us all game long. So I'm giving us an F in that category. We gotta win, win the transition ball game. Again, defensively, you know, as defensive you could possibly get in transition, I think they, they really confused our point guards, our distributors, uh, and, and did not allow us to get out in transition. We only had nine points off turnovers. They had 16 points off those turnovers. And there were stretches, you know, again, Brian Allen at one point, Brian Allen and Marco Vianicic for an outstanding fast break. You know, one of the best fast breaks that we've seen all year. But then everything kind of slowed down Fall again. Apart. We'd run down the floor and try to run our fast-paced offense, but then it, it got turned around really quickly, and you know we, we had to slow up, we had to back the ball out, and all of that. Number three, we got to attack the basket and get to the line. This was the worst game, I think, of the season in that regard. Six for nine from the free throw line. I think we've been hovering around, you know, or trying to get to that 22 free throw mark. 
didn't get there. Not even close. Yeah. You know, six for nine is, is unacceptable. That's not attacking the basket. That's not trying to get to the rim and settling for jump shots as, as shown by the 21, uh, 21 three-point attempts that we had today. So that's an F as well. I'm not even giving it as an F. <laughs> we, got, we got kicked out of class long before we got an F. We got booted today. We got but booted. I'm going to reinstate us before the next day. Yes. we got to come on and turn it back on. We're still trying to win the CAA tournament here. Right, right. <laughs> All right, well, there still were some great highlights from today's game. Let's take a look at our package made by our great crew here at Courtside Seats. Back to the courtside seats post game show. We're here again at the Mason Inn and Alumni, so Alumni Association event here for homecoming. This year's theme for homecoming: the evolution of greatness. Dan and I are going to uh, build this segment off of the evolution of greatness and some of the guys that we've got coming up with no seniors on this team and, and what we can expect moving forward. Yeah, you know, I think too right off the bat, especially in recent games, if you've just been paying attention. Of late, the last you know three, four, five games, yep. John Arledge, Brian Allen, immediately come to mind. They're in the same class, so they're going to play together all the way through. Um, you know, they've gotten much better in the second half of the season. I think right. uh, Brian Allen, number one in the CAA in assist to turnover ratio, um, and John Arledge set four career highs in the last five games. <laughs> uh, both of these guys, this new starting lineup for them, I think is doing them great things. Arledge with. Corey and Brian now shooting from the outside gives John a little bit of room to work inside. Um, Brian, as we mentioned, not a lot of pressure to pass the ball. He doesn't have to worry, oh, am I going to pass? Am I going to shoot? He's got Corey to kind of help him out with that. These are two guys I'm really excited to see moving forward. Well, on the, the topic of Brian, you know, I think we talked about this a lot in the post game show that I think it, it does him wonders by playing off the ball because as a point guard, he's less inclined to give the ball up when he knows he's, you know, or, thinks he's not getting it back right. you know whereas as an off guard you know, all he's doing he's throwing the ball into the post he's relocating mm -hmm. and could potentially get the ball back and will get the ball back much more often for John Arledge the guy that he reminds me of is Mike Mo. Yeah. you know I Mike Mo, it. as a junior the first half of his junior year was average no it wasn't bad it was average um, but Mike came on in, in the later half of the season going to the CAA tournament was one of the best, best big men in the CAA. Yeah. I think we're seeing little little sparks of that starting to come out of John. Um, and, and, you know, going back to Brian real quick, real quick I feel like last season, and this doesn't mean a knock on Brian, but sometimes he would get the ball and say, I got to make a play. Right. I have to make a play. And I think he's realizing that he can certainly make a play if the shot's there. He's not afraid to take it. Right. But he's okay with giving the ball up. And he knows that with Corey on the court, especially in the starting lineup, he's going to get it back at times. Right. Corey has no problem passing it back to Brian. Right. Um, and I think these are all great things that are going to work to the success of these guys moving forward. Yeah, you mentioned Corey Edwards. Moving on to Corey Edwards as a sophomore, uh, you know, he's really benefiting from having Brian Allen in yeah. the starting lineup, having another guy who can help him make those decisions on the floor. Uh, he's definitely the best true point guard on this team. You know, somebody who 
is not necessarily looking for his shot most of the time. He's a good decision maker, but over the last several weeks, we've really seen his jump shot come alive. You know, keep in mind, his dad was a scoring guard, score first guard in college. Right. You know, so that's it's definitely in the blood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we mention it sometimes that we see, we feel like Coach Hewitt really took Corey under his wing, <laughs> so to speak. I don't know if they're both from, or because of they're both from the same area in New York. Right. But you always see, I mean, you mention it all the time, Corey makes a mistake on the floor. First person he looks at is Coach Hewitt. Right. And, and to see what he did wrong. Um, sometimes we're in the post-game pre post press conference together, they have a little banter, they joke back and forth when we have a good win. Right. Um, and I think that speaks to the success of Corey. Um, Coach Hewitt sees something in him that he really likes moving forward. And he says, hey, you're going to be my guard. Right. You're my one guard moving forward. You're going to bring the ball up. You're going to run the plays. You're going to be my assist guy. Um, and, I, and I like that for Corey moving forward. Yeah, I think it, the funniest part to me is, you know, not not just that he looks at Coach Hewitt when he makes a mistake, but when you watch Coach Hewitt with some of these other guys, you know, they come off the floor and he either shakes a hand and moves on, allows one of the assistant coaches to take care of him. With Anale, he'll put his arm around him <laughs> and you know tell him what he did well, what That's he didn't do well. That's only one Anale mentioned today. Though. Yes, <laughs> it, he he does that with Anale and with Corey. The minute Corey comes off the floor, he's getting an earful. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't talk. I don't think. I don't think Coach Hewitt during games talks to Corey Edwards as much as he yells at him. And I think that's. I mean, that's almost a good thing you can look at. I mean, oh, yeah. He's got that extra attention that he needs, and it's clearly right. working. Right. I mean, yeah. it's showing up in a shot. I don't know what he's doing in practice lately. And it's not like it was an off-season switch. It seemed like a mid-season switch. Right. And it's when he earned his his playing time. I mean, you look at Brian and Corey. One of them started the season, the other one was coming off the bench. Then they switched. Then I felt like they keep switching, and now all of a sudden they're both starting. Right. Who knew that that was the key right. to right. doing it? Yeah, I mean, Corey Edwards is a, is a New York guy. Keep in mind, he can take people yelling at him. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Let's look at the big men real quick. Eric Coates, finally, we feel like he's healthy from that hip injury, yep. hip surgery in the offseason. It's hard to bang down there. you got to imagine, I'm not a very tall guy, but you got to imagine <laughs> it's hard to bang down there when you're afraid that you might re-injure your hip. I mean, he fell today, and I gasped because I was afraid that he was going to hurt, and he was fine getting up. So Eric Hope's back now, full, ready to play, ready to go hard down low. Yep. He's finally found that baby hook, that soft shot, and he's getting those and ones. Um, now you just got to work on the free throws coming down the stretch here, but getting those and ones, finally figuring out that he can play as big as he really is, and only a sophomore. Right. You know, that's got to be a positive here. And stepping up without Johnny Williams on the floor. Once Johnny Williams comes back, and we hope that it's this season, and we wish him his best, coming off a concussion, um, you know, I really think that that's going to help him, uh, you know, get more rest. If he gets in some foul trouble, Johnny Williams can help him there. It'll take some of the pressure off when he's on the floor. Right. Um, I think Eric is playing his best basketball right now, too. Oh, I, I think you are absolutely right. You know, I, I think there's a lot of room for growth there for him. You know, to he's continued to improve all season long. One thing he's got to do is stay out of foul trouble. Yep. You know, he got in a little bit of foul trouble early on today and kind of took him out of his game. But he's one of those guys. He's an emotional kid. Yep. He's another one. You know, Philadelphia kid. Yep. You know, he's tough. He's a tough kid and, and really gets in there and gets after it. I mean, going back to what we said about Corey and Coach Hewitt's relationship, I yeah. mean, Roland Houston, the assistant coach, is his uncle. He looks right at Roland Houston <laughs> right. to see what right. he did wrong. I mean, that's one of the main reasons Eric is here is because Coach Houston came here with Coach Hewitt. Uh, that's got to be great for Eric to have a guy like that, right. one of the best big man coaches, to be able to help him moving forward. And you wouldn't have expected this guy to only be a sophomore if you looked at him. Right. And, I mean, well, remember, too, he's the highest rated recruit that Mason has ever gotten. I think a 94 he was ranked on, yeah, on ESPN like coming through. I mean, such a score to get this kid. And I think fans are starting to see um, what he can bring to the table. But another score that we got from overseas, yeah. well, overseas and then California, <laughs> right. a guy you really liked in the preseason, Marco Gianic. Yeah, I said in the early going, I thought Marco Gianic was the most game-ready freshman that we've ever seen. Uh, I know some people disagreed, went along the side of Luke Hancock, but I, I think Coach Hewitt, Coach Kreider, all you know, all the, the entire coaching staff really saw a lot out of this kid. You know, he's definitely, at least in my mind, the most physical guy we have on this roster. Um, sometimes it can be a detriment, you know, as in when he's <laughs> elbowing people in the head as he did today. Right, as he did tonight. Um, you know, he, he's not hitting his jump shots, but to me, this season, his freshman season, um, 
it's not a bad thing. It's nothing to get discouraged about. And I'm really proud of the way that he has gone out there and continued to stay mentally tough, continued to get after it, continued to shoot the ball. You know, he hasn't gone away from the jump shot even though he hasn't hit it. Um, but I, I'm really looking forward to him being here for the next four years and continue to grow, continue to be a star on this team. Yeah, I mean, you said it best, and I think that he had kind of a tough transition. I mean, I remember yeah. there was one time, I don't remember the exact play, but I think he stepped over um, the inbound line during an inbound play for their team, and he didn't know that you couldn't do that, apparently. Right. Right. Um, and there's little things that I feel like the transition game really was tough for him to figure out. Um, his ball security has been a, become a lot better. Um, I think he's become a lot smarter. I mean, he was listed as a guard, a 6'8 guard. Right. I mean, he is a guy that can shoot the ball. And you mentioned he's, he's struggling a little bit right now, yeah. but we got him for four years. Right. I think he'll slowly, surely begin to progress and figure out that jump shot. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go ahead and take another break, and we will be right back with you with our green and gold stars of the game. Keep on watching. Welcome back to the Courtside Seats Post Game Show. I'm Cody Norman here with Daniel Zimmett at an at a alumni event here in the Mason Inn. We're looking at the green and gold stars of the game. You know, it's only a star by default. I mean, after a 78 to 60 loss, it's hard to say one particular star. I mean, Sherrod Wright, you got to give it to him in my in my perspective. Just by the way, he started four for four from three. He ended the game with 19 points, but he only had four in the second half. We need a guy like him to really step up and bring this team back and continue those 11 to two runs and step up on defense. Um, it, it was overall, I mean, a weak game. It was a team loss. I'm not sure if I can give an actual star to any individual person. It was a tough one to pick. Yeah, it's it, tough to hand anybody yeah. a star of the game yeah. in an 18 point loss. But I'll tell you what, I'm not giving my star of the game to just one person. Okay. I'm giving my star of the game to the three people who thought that they were the most important part of the game tonight, and those were the referees. You know, we sat and listened to, co to Commissioner Tom Yeager a couple weeks ago uh, at one of the Mason games on TV talk about how, you know, he wanted to see more fouls called. Right. You know, that was his biggest complaint about the officiating in the CAA. Now, let me give you some numbers. The CAA average for fouls called in a game per team, keep in mind, okay. per team is 18 fouls a game. The Big Ten at 15, the SEC at 17, the ACC at 17, and the Big East, which is widely regarded as one of the most physical conferences in all of college basketball yep. at just 17. I mean, you say 18. There were 19 in the first half today. Right. I mean, right. Uh, it's this is 18 once you said per, per team. game. Yeah. Oh, right. Exactly. Right. Uh, that's unbelievable. So we're looking at, you know, about 36 fouls that we're calling per game. 36 fouls per 40 minutes of basketball is absolutely ridiculous. Mason, mind you, is the, the top... Uh, I guess victim of foul calls in the most penalized team in the conference, nearly 20 fouls, yeah. or over 20 fouls rather, over 20 fouls, almost 21 fouls per game committed by Mason alone. That's nearly two fouls higher than every other team in our conference, which is absurd to me. There's only four other teams in all of the other big four conferences with 20 plus fouls per game. I mean, I, it doesn't make any sense. I, I, I don't get it. And you said it best. There's no accountability for referees. Right. There's none. And, and I don't understand why. And, and I think it's because, and you and I both played sports growing up, you, there's a whole, you know, thing around you're never supposed to blame the refs on right. losing. Right. But why not? Right. I well, mean, why can't you? At, it, at an not, maybe not a loss, loss, but a, a factor, certainly right. a giant factor. I mean, they contributed to the run right. big time they contributed to, the, to georgia state's big run with those three fouls 
um, on on both ends of the court. Right. Um, absolutely. Why can't you call them accountable? Right. You know, an 18 point loss is hard to, to blame on a referee. I don't blame them for a run of any sort. But Mason has the 10th most fouls per game in the nation. Yeah. 10th most in the nation. There's no other teams in the CAA that are even in the top 50. And I can't imagine we're actually committing these many fouls. Right. That, that's what I, mean, I, I don't, it just baffles me every single game that we're at, short, you know, we're at 20 fouls, 21 fouls, 22 fouls. It's, it, it's absurd, really. I mean, I'd call us homers at time, but I still truly believe that when Coach Hewitt argues, he argues for valid calls. Right. When fouls are called and you and I are sitting there like, eh, I look at Coach Hewitt. If Coach Hewitt's not arguing, I'm like, well, maybe I'm wrong. Right. I mean, Coach Hewitt argues on valid calls. Right. Absolutely. Why can't they be accountable? I, I agree with you. Yeah. Absolutely right. I, I, don't, I don't even know what to say. It's baffling. I don't get it. Yeah. I just don't it's get baffling. it. It's baffling. I don't get it. All right. Well, that's all the time we have today. Our next game for the Patriots, Wednesday, February 20th at Hofstra. Our next broadcast for the post-game show is Saturday, February 23rd against Orman and Mary, a very good shooting team. So be sure to tune in to both those games. Every game is big. we got to win for in the tournament. Yeah, and our, our maybe most most impressive I don't know uh, the one that the one show we're looking forward to uh, here coming up March 8th at yep. the Green Turtle make sure you come out and, and watch the show see the show see everything that goes on behind the scenes Fairfax Green Turtle Fairfax Green Turtle <laughs> right we want to thank Jake McLernan the producer of the show Nathan Garduno Brian Dombrowski Rob Horan David Carroll Carol Schweigert and the rest of the Alumni Association for letting us be here tonight at the Mason Inn at this Alumni Association event. Thank you all for watching. It's been the Courtside Seats post-game show. For Daniel Zimmett, I'm Cody Norman. We'll see you later.